Uh, our speaker today is Carl Hobart. He is the author of Raising Global IQ, Preparing Our Students for a Shrinking Planet. He is a graduate of Middlebury College and the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts. Today, he is here to talk to us about Rwanda, where he has worked tirelessly since the height of the genocide. Under the leadership of President Paul Kagame and along with Dr. Paul Farmer of Partners in Health, Hobart has helped the Rwandan government's ministries of education and foreign affairs to, to improve nursery through grade 12 education, introduce Mandarin China, Chinese to public, private, and parochial schools there, and to create a national youth-focused conflict resolution program to, to prevent renewed Hutu and Tutsi tensions. Please welcome Carl Hobart. Thank you for that very kind introduction. I appreciate it. It is truly an honor to be here today to speak with all of you about a country I love, Rwanda. And the first thing I'm going to do is start off with a trick that gorillas in the Gorilla National Park in Rwanda taught me. They taught me how to think differently about conflict. <laughs> Gorillas peel the banana from the opposite end by pinching it because it takes all the strings inside with it and you have a little holder at the bottom. How about that for something gorillas can teach you? So the reason I bring that up is, please think differently about Rwanda. President Kagame is under fire for being a dictator. But what I'm going to explain today is what has happened since 1994 in the height of the genocide, 25 years ago this year, and what he is trying to do to this day. The other way to think about things differently, does anyone know what the word listen spelled another way is? Think about it, using the same letters in the word listen. Silent. So by remaining listen, by, by remaining silent, excuse me, and by listening, I ask you to think differently about the conflict in Rwanda that exists to this day. And finally, as I teach my students at Boston University in my conflict resolution classes, You've got two ears and one mouth. What does that mean? You should listen twice as much as you speak. Please think about those three things. The banana, listen spelled another way is silent, and listening twice as much as you speak. I'm starting as an introduction with about a 10 minute segment of a film called Sometimes in April. The beginning of Rwanda's genocide in 1994 was in April. And you'll learn a lot about the history of the genocide through this introduction, including what then President Bill Clinton had to say. There we go. So I'm sorry you didn't get to see all of the history, but what they talked about there was very important. It was the Belgians that took over Rwanda as part of the spoils of war after World War I from the Germans. And what did they do? They decided to divide and conquer. By deciding who Tutsis were, taller, lighter skinned people, they represented 14.5% of the population. And they controlled all the land and all the cattle. The Hutus, darker skinned, stockier, they worked the land for the Tutsis. And they represented 85% of the population. And one half of 1%, TWA, T-W-A, a group of pygmies. Pygmies who never really got involved in a conflict between Hutus and Tutsis. And that started right after World War I. So for decades and decades and decades, the Belgians divided and conquered these people, showing a form of racism I've never seen before in history, so that they could control 
this country of Rwanda, as well as Burundi to the south and the Democratic Republic of Congo today used to be Zaire to the west. That is why French is spoken in the Democratic Republic of Congo, Rwanda, and Burundi to this day in this region because of the Belgians. So we'll be focusing on that today and looking at post-94 and the height of the genocide and what's happened in that country. But first, I'd like you to take a look at this slide. Again, thinking differently. Like the banana, like the word listen spelled another way is silent. Do you see that beautiful setting there in Rwanda on Lake Kivu, which is on the border of the Democratic Republic of Congo and Rwanda? Do you see something else as an image there, everybody? People. People, good, very good. You saw the people way in the back, very peaceful. Excuse me? Someone said there is a fetus. Where is the fetus? In, in the tree. Do you see the feet that are white up on the right in the tree? In the hands. And do you see the hands? The and the face and the forehead? No. Start to lean. Oh. Oh. Yes. oh. Yes. What am I looking for? That oh light bulb going on over your head. The realization, does anyone not see that? Please raise your hand if you didn't see it at first. Please raise your hand if you still don't see it. I'm blind, don't see what? I see The baby. Can everyone see the baby? Now, imagine using this with youth and having them lean together and say, Explain that to someone right next to you. Can you help your colleagues here by explaining to someone who still doesn't see it? The toes, the feet, the knees, the legs. Look at the belly. Look at the arm and the fingers. Look at the mouth. And you know what I've been do doing in Rwanda for years? Getting people to think differently about a country that is divided and how to look at it differently. Not just Hutu and Tutsi and Twa, but how to look at everything from politics to economics to medicine in a different way. That's what I'm talking about today. And one other person I admired for years who also did her work in terms of what she believed in in Rwanda? Diane Fossey. Yes. If you've seen Gorillas in the Mist, that was Diane Fossey who taught at Cornell and believed in protecting the gorillas. Well, there were plenty of Hutus who did not agree with her. That majority of the population who needed to poach for the skin, for the meat, for every part of the body. Do you think they agreed with someone coming to protect what they made their money off of? Very little money. On December 26th, 1985, Diane Fossey was massacred with machetes. To this day, her memory lives on with an institute there where research is being done and the gorillas do now have a gorilla national park where those people who are poor are actually working in the park to help protect the gorillas. So President Kagame has introduced a park where it costs you $1,500 a day to visit, and that money goes back into the people who are working there. But the reason I bring up Diane Fossey is because of another person. I have worked there since after the height of the genocide, believing in children and improving education there. President Kagame, right after the genocide of 1994, said, I have a term that's very important. That term is she, S-H-E-E. -E. Our most important piece of defense for our country and no longer having a genocide is S, security. Who did he turn to? The state of Israel. To send people there from Israel to train 
the army. H, healthcare. He came to Partners in Health, based here in Boston, Paul Farmer, Jim Kim, and Ophelia Dahl. They helped set up the Partners in Health network in Rwanda with clinics all over the country. The first E, the economy. He went to friend and colleague Michael Porter at Harvard Business School. Michael Porter went over there to help rebuild the economy back and forth and back and forth. And this man, low on the totem pole, was the second E in she, education. Helping President and Mrs. Kagame, the first lady, lady, to improve kindergarten through grade 12 education in Rwanda. In the private sector, private schools, public schools, and parochial schools as well. And this started, again, right after the height of the genocide, and it's something I continue to do and believe in to this day. Because in Rwanda, there are what I call winners and losers in the zip code lottery. Just like here in the United States. Winners in the zip code lottery? Weston, Wellesley, Concord. Losers in the zip code lottery? Roxbury, Dorchester. And the list goes on. Here. That's a picture from what's called the Home of Hope Orphanage run by Mother Teresa's protégés, missionaries of charity. And these children are examples of the losers in the zip code lottery for whom I've helped to rebuild education in this country, all the way up to those who are very well off, teaching them how, during their formative years of life, to get along better. And this, I wanted to show you as I began, is the cover of the copy of my latest book, Raising Global IQ, Beacon Press did not want to include the Rwandan flag anywhere. They said it's not going to be marketable enough in Rwanda. We're going to make more money in other countries. Do you see the letter O in global? That is the flag of Rwanda. I force the issue. That is how important that country is to me. And I'd like to show you a quote by someone I admire, and this quote has helped me in terms of the work I've done in Rwanda. The ultimate measure of a man or woman is not where she or he stands in moments of comfort and convenience, but where she or he stands at times of challenge or controversy. Would anyone like to guess who said that? Back in the 1960s in the United States? Very good. A graduate of Boston University, where he got his doctorate in theology, Dr. Martin Luther King. There's Rwanda. It is a tiny country, slightly the size of the state of Maryland. As you get closer in, you can see the Democratic Republic of Congo just to the west. You can see Uganda to the north, Burundi to the south, and Tanzania to the south and east. That's what's called the Great Lakes region, along with Kenya. There are these beautiful lakes in that region. And that's why part of my goal with President Kagame in improving education was to get three scholarships a year for students to three military academies in the United States. This is for foreign students. What are those three military academies? Coast Guard Academy, because of the Great Lakes region, West Point, and the Air Force Academy. So many people would say, wait a minute, that's US taxpayer money. Why are you bringing three students a year, men and women, to those three military universities or military academies. Why? Because we're doing this with Israel. We're doing this with South Korea. We're doing this with other countries around the world. And people don't even know that. But that creates this brotherhood, sisterhood while they're in college that is helping us out in terms of our international interests in the future. So that is a picture of Rwanda. And now we get a little bit closer. Here you can see Kigali, the capital, where I've lived. I returned last August from living there for two and a half years. And you can see how the Democratic Republic of the Congo, again, is to the west. Uganda is to the north. Tanzania 
is to the east and Burundi is to the south. Look at these beautiful hills of Rwanda. That is why Rwanda is called Land of a Thousand Hills. Their hills are used for agriculture. The top three products in Rwanda, coffee, tea, and bananas. President Kagame even invited the CEO of Starbucks Corporation from Seattle, Washington to bring a team over. They went to Rwanda and started buying coffee from Rwanda. The other thing they're now introducing, green beans pineapple, other agricultural products. The problem there is it's not making them as much money as they'd like. President Kagame is moving in the direction of more industry and technology, which I will explain in a few minutes. Remember I talked about Tutsis controlling the land? They also control the cattle. And cattle is a big industry there as well. So when you go to President Kagame's Camp David, one hour west of Kigali, the capital, you drive in under heavy security and you see this gorgeous farm. And you see these cattle everywhere. Who were they controlled by before the height of the genocide? Tutsis. Hutus work the land. But President Kagame just two years ago said it is now illegal to say Hutu and Tutsi. We are all Rwandans. So I asked him as we're pulling in in a motorcade, why do you still have these as a symbol of being Tutsi? President Kagame, I know you were raised as a Tutsi. And so was Jeanette, the first lady. She grew up in Burundi. You grew up in Uganda, outside the country because your parents took you away as children did not want to get you killed, you are both Tutsi. How can you now say we're all Rwandans, you can still show that you're Tutsi? He looked right back at me and he said, that's your interpretation. We are in fact all Rwandans and I'm not gonna say I'm a Tutsi. I may be able to show what people interpret as being Tutsi, but I am really not. There are still Hutus or former Hutus who do not like President Kagame to this day because he's demonstrating that he is a Tutsi minority, though he says we are all Rwandans. And now we get to the point where I really want to take off, and that is 1994. Do you remember in 1994 when O.J. Simpson was driving his white Bronco? down the highway and you could see from the helicopter that the police were following him slowly and his ex-wife had recently been murdered and Richard Nixon passed away. So did Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis. So did Kurt Cobain, founder of the band Nirvana out in Washington state. These were all the huge stories in the United States. Do you know what was going on in Rwanda starting on April 6th of that same year when these were the things that we focused on? This man was the then Hutu president of the country. He had just gone to Tanzania to broker a peace accord with then General Paul Kagame who had come from Uganda, where he grew up in a refugee camp, into Rwanda South for four years, 1990 to 94, with other Tutsis who wanted to return to the country, where Hutus were in control. RPF forces for four years tried to take over the country and they were not able to, thanks in great part to this man who got his arms from a president named Mitterrand of France. What does he do? Oh my gosh, I'm fearing the Tutsi army called RPF. They're getting closer and closer to my residence in the capital. I've got to go right next door to Tanzania to the city of Arusha to sign peace accords. 
He's flying back in on the night of April 6, 1994. Right next to him in his Learjet is the president of Burundi, the country to the south where Mrs. Kagame grew up. That man is also a Hutu. A surface-to-air missile, or SAM, picks off that plane as it's going on its final descent into Kigali Airport. There's the French jet that they were in, and that's what it looked like when it hit the ground. What did this start the night of April 6th to April 7th, 1994? The height of the genocide. And you know what I teach my students in the field of conflict resolution? You have to look at all sides. Was it radical Hutus who did not agree with the moderate Hutu president who had just signed peace accords? They were like, no way, we're all Hutus. We are not going to let Tutsis back in this country. Or was it General Paul Kagame who told his forces just outside the capital You've got cheap Chinese SAMs or surface-to-air missiles that can fit in a golf bag, pick off that plane when it comes in. I have asked him that question. He will still not answer it to this day. It is a debatable topic to this day. The genocide started on the evening of April 6th to 7th, and we were worried about domestic issues here. Over the course of 100 days, Hutu power the extremists who were getting very well organized in terms of what they were going to do, because they'd had four years to think about it, as the Tutsis, President Kagame's RPF forces, had come in from Uganda slowly, they started broadcasting after that night when the plane shot down via Hutu power radio. What do they do? They take over the radio building in the center of Kigali. And you know what's right across the street from that to this day? The National Post Office. They were able to break in and control both places to be able to go to the National Post Office and find out where every single Hutu and Tutsi lived around the country. <coughs> and then with the small transistor radios that they had and the poor people had out in the countryside, they were able to call out those names and that information so people could start killing Tutsis or moderate Hutus who were hiding Tutsis or those who married as Tutsis Hutus and they had half Tutsi children. They had to go too. And you know what their nickname became, those Tutsis? Or anyone with Tutsi blood? Cockroaches. Look what started. Young men brought into this. Young men who had M16s, AK-47s, Uzis. Even boys, boy soldiers. They were brought into this. We call this Intehahamwe. These are the boys who felt accepted. And for every kill, they got a liter of Belgian beer. So not only were they being accepted for killing for their cause, Hutus, but they were learning to drink alcohol. And look at that man, Paul Kagame, and how tall he is as general of the forces. And he is, he has his military strategy down to a science. He's like Napoleon. Keep your men together, keep them well organized, have military strategies. He came in in what he called the axis from the south, straight in, but then he came in with two fish hooks also, meaning his troops hooked out to the right and left and came back in from the south to take over the capital of Kigali, a three-front strategy. To this day, it fascinates me how he developed that. So he's there, and this man is the general, Daech, Canadian man, who was at Hotel Rwanda. There it is right there, built by the Belgians, called Hotel de Mille Collines. They made a movie about that. This is where, after the genocide started in Kigali, those moderate Hutus, excuse me, those moderate Hutus and the Tutsis were able to go and hide because of the hotel manager who, let, who did not let Hutu power in. So this hotel 
thanks to that general and the manager, were able to protect these people. But do you see that manager, whom I've met before? He sent a fax back to the United States. You can see how there's a circle drive there. On that main floor, there's the business office where you can go and return emails. He sent a fax to the United Nations on April 8th saying to Boutros Boutros Ghali, then head of the UN, Kofi Annan, number two, and Madeleine Albright, the United States ambassador to the UN. We have 437 troops here. We need 3,000 more from different countries around the world, all UN forces, to quell this revolt, what could become a genocide. Madeleine Albright flies up to the White House to meet with Bill Clinton. This is not long after Black Hawk Down, what happened in Mogadishu. This is not a very strategic country in terms of importance. It's not the Strait of Hormuz. It's not the Straits of Gibraltar. It's not oil rich. And Madeleine Albright, a graduate of Wellesley College. Madeleine Albright, whom I've met before and I called her on this, said, we can't send troops there. It may be like a Vietnam, and you're not going to get reelected in your second term, President Clinton. You know what Madeleine Albright wanted? To become ambassador to the UN in term one, and if he won a second term, to become Secretary of State. Did she win? And Kofi Annan, who was head of peacekeeping forces, he did not want to tick off any of the permanent members of the UN Security Council, including the French, by saying we're going to send forces in there because he wanted to become the number one at the UN. Did he succeed? And he won the Nobel Peace Prize. Is this ironic? I have met both of them, and I have called their bluffs. It's interesting what happens. Remember the word listen spelled another way? They both remained silent and walked away. Look what I've seen over there since going not long after the height of the genocide. Dull machetes. What was one strategy of Hutu power in 1994, right before April, when the genocide started? Hey, those Hutus who work the land, remember I told you, they work for the Tutsis. They need machetes to cut down the bananas to cut the tea, to, to go out and search for the coffee. They cut down some of the coffee plants. They overordered from the Chinese at 27 cents a piece. Those big wooden cases were delivered to the Kigali International Airport in nets that were dropped with parachutes. The men in Hutu power came and picked up extra machetes. We've got to go and work the land. Hutu extremist leaders said with these new machetes to make it look legitimate. There is a museum in Kigali that is incredibly emotional for me every time I go. One room alone has color photos on pieces of string that hang down from the ceiling, roughly three inches apart, and it goes all the way around the room. Men, women, and children who were Tutsis, or moderate Hutus, who were killed at the height of the genocide. And that's only one room. Another room, other genocides. World War II and the Jews and the Holocaust. And the list goes on. This has so affected me because of what I saw when I first went there. And when you go there after the height of the genocide, after the height of any issue, you, not just, you don't just see it, you smell it, you hear it, often you hear silence, you see it, you feel it, it has a profound impact on you. PTSD, oh, it goes beyond that. And I could have gone completely crazy, come back to the United States and gone to McLean Hospital for the rest of my life, or pursued something I believe in, teaching our students 
in their formative years of life and students in Rwanda how to prevent this from happening through education. What I call preventive diplomacy. We all know about preventive medicine, preventing the cancer that comes about in terms of using mammograms, colonoscopies, etc. I call this preventive diplomacy, teaching students in their formative years about how to prevent conflict, to prevent the cancer of conflict. And the vitamin C's to help prevent that cancer of conflict more effectively, communication, comprehension, compromise, collaboration, creativity, coexistence. So you see these photos, and you see one example of a church like this where all of the skeletons are in these underground caverns. People would go to churches to try and be saved, and the priests would see a machete out in front. These are Catholic priests in Rwanda who are from Rwanda. Can you imagine a Hutu power person coming up in front saying, we're going to kill you unless you let us in there? Do you know how many Catholic priests in 1994 let people in there? They raped, they pillaged, they threw grenades in there, and they hacked. And these churches to this day still have bullet marks, have lost all of their stained glass windows. And one church where I've taken high school students from the state of Massachusetts for seven years, seven different summers, including Belmont Hill School, Dana Hall School, Weston High School, a school in Roxbury, both public and private school kids. They go into one, and a student, as we walk in, says, wow, what is that kind of deep red color that's on the brick wall there? And I said, you're going to see a lot more, but I'm going to explain that red spot right now. That's where they used to throw babies to kill them so they didn't have to waste bullets on them. Imagine the impact that has on students when they see that. And they sit there and again, they smell it, they see it, they hear it. It has a profound impact on them. And these photos reveal certain famous people whom I've dealt with before as well. Upper left, President George W. Bush putting a Medal of Honor around a man named Paul Rusesabagina, Hotel Rwanda's manager. Paul Rusesabagina now lives in the US. He is never returning to Rwanda because Paul Kagame, lower right, feels as if he is a Hutu extremist who is funneling money that he makes off of his book tour, off of movies, off of speeches, back to Hutu power, which is now moved right next door in the Democratic Republic of Congo. So Paul Rusesabagina looks very good in the movie Hotel Rwanda, but according to President Paul Kagame, is not a good guy at all. And look at Paul Kagame there. State of Massachusetts, Carl Hobart helping him with education reform there. He called me up four different times when his children were getting old enough to go to middle school and high school. Carl, where will I send my oldest son, Ivan? I said, well, I'm presently teaching at Belmont Hill School in Belmont, Massachusetts. Would you consider Belmont Hill? Ivan Kagami, as Priscilla knows, my friend from Belmont Hill, came to Belmont Hill School. He then went on to Brooks School in North Andover, Massachusetts, because Brooks had seven-day boarding. We did not. Second child, Ange, the only daughter, went to Dana Hall School in Wellesley, Massachusetts. The third and the fourth children, both boys, Ian and Brian, went to Deerfield Academy out in western Massachusetts. And in terms of college, Ivan went on to West Point and then dropped out. He did not like it at all. Ange went to Smith College, and Ian and Brian both went to Williams College. The baby, Brian, is a senior there this year. You had no idea about this, but President and Mrs. Kagami have driven by 
Emerson Hospital numerous times to go visit their children in Western Massachusetts. So think about that. A winner in the genocide having the ability to send his children. What about the others? That's when he said, get over here and help me improve it then. Here are other photos of President and Mrs. Kagame. You see Paul and Jeanette in the upper left-hand corner. You can see Ange in that photo upper middle when she is visiting the White House with her father. This is the girl who went to Smith College. She just finished her master's in international relations down at Columbia University, and she got married this past summer. And you can see President Mrs. Kagame with the Queen and other famous shots there, famous photos there. One other thing I'm going to tell you is President Kagame is keeping his options open in terms of his children, not just in terms of education, but where they're going to live and be citizens in the future. He has bought recently two houses in Scarsdale, New York, each for over $2 million. Oldest son, Ivan, lives in one, a private equity trader in New York City. And Ange and her new husband, also a Tutsi, who went to MIT, lives in the other house. Is that fair? He would say, well, look what I'm doing in terms of rebuilding this country. What the difference between Rwanda of 1994 and Rwanda today is amazing. That country has changed in so many incredible ways. You can see some of the investments that have been made. For example, Marriott Hotel now has a five-star hotel that is a stone's throw up the hill from President and Mrs. Kagame's residence. That's where every head of state stays when going there. Marriott decided to invest in that country. You can see other pictures around that lower left-hand corner photo. The convention center looks like a big globe. And there are conventions that are being held there with leaders from around Africa coming in, as well as from around the world. So President Kagame would be the first to say, I am turning my country around, and yes, my kids come first. But our country is moving in the right direction. Issues that I've been dealing with when going over there. I hate to admit this, but in 2016, I made the decision when I was asked at Boston University to do so, where I was running what's called the Global Literacy Institute, teaching conflict resolution and teaching teachers and teachers from around the United States how to teach conflict resolution and international relations in elementary, middle, and high schools. I was asked when I was at BU by the Trump administration pre-elections to be an advisor on foreign affairs and education. Just an advisor giving him advice on policy decisions pre-election and what he would talk about when he'd go to airline hangars around the country with full audiences. I had no idea he was going to get elected. What happened? After that historic day, he had, between election day and inauguration, the ability to name over 4,000 people to different positions in Washington, D.C. and around the world. I could have gone down to Maryland, Washington, D.C., or Virginia to work in the international relations intelligence field I stepped up to the plate and went full-time to Rwanda. Why? Because I was going to be joined by a man named Peter Vrooman, who went to Phillips Academy in Andover, Massachusetts, and then went to Harvard. At Phillips Academy, he loved French. When he went on to Harvard, he majored in Arabic. Peter Vrooman, career State Department official, is now our ambassador to Rwanda. What were we going to be doing? Not only improving education in the entire region of the Great Lakes region of Africa, 
starting in Rwanda. We were also going to be introducing Mandarin Chinese and Arabic into the school system there so that we could not only help out President Kagame, who wanted Chinese because of his relationship with China, which is growing, but introducing Arabic because of his relationship with Saudi Arabia and Qatar, both countries injecting millions, if not billions, of capital. So my job over there with Peter Vrooman was number one, to introduce languages, those two languages, Arabic and Mandarin, and number two, to set up a national conflict resolution program for youth that I'd been doing on a part-time basis for years. Do you agree with it or not? I took a risk. I have three daughters who live in the state of Massachusetts, Leah, Olivia, and Juliana. Those three daughters sat down with me and said, Dad, we know what your passion is. Your passion is teaching conflict resolution. Your passion is teaching languages. Your passion is helping others. Go. President Kagame gave me four round trip tickets a year to come back to visit them. If my daughters wanted to use any of those tickets, they could come over to visit me as well. I ended up going back and forth and back and forth while I was doing this conflict resolution work and introducing languages in Rwanda. And one day, President Kagame stood up and he said, Carl, I've got an announcement I'm going to make on national television about our languages. And I said, what is that? Right now, they're Kenya Rwanda is the national language. French is number two. Uh, and we've got uh, English is number three. And I'm adding Mandarin and Arabic. He goes, see those three fingers you just put up? I'm going to flip them. And I said, what exactly do you mean, Mr. President? He goes, I'm going to announce today that English is our new national language, French is number two, English is number three, and I'm going to add that Mandarin and Arabic have been set up around the country, especially because President Xi and his wife are coming very soon from China. And this was last summer when I got a chance to meet President Xi and his wife and show them how the Mandarin Chinese program, as I had done at Belmont Hill School, had been set up. You know what President Kagame knew he was going to be dealing with, and that's why he called me in? Conflict. How about those people who only speak Kenya Rwanda? And immediately he put it to number three. Suffocation? Undercurrent that's going to come back to haunt him? He told me to go out and deal with it through children. So getting out there, playing zone defense, continuing to work on conflict resolution around the country. And he assigned me to go right next door in the Democratic Republic of Congo to work with his arch rival former Hutu power people. They're now called FDLR. And they're based in Goma, in the hills right outside of Goma, in the Democratic Republic of Congo, right on the border with Rwanda and the town of Gisenye on Lake Kivu. So I kept going from the capital out there back and forth to make sure that I was working on conflict resolution. I was using my Kenya Rwanda, and I was making sure that I kept an eye on their plans for possibly coming back to attack Rwanda. Well, you know what happened since then? Have you heard about the Ebola outbreak in Africa? Guess where this is? I've talked about the Gorilla National Park already. There is also the Volcano National Park right near there. And then there's Goma. Three provinces just to the west of Rwanda and the Democratic Republic of the Congo are the ones where the Ebola outbreak is. Right where all of President Kagame's arch rivals are, including FDLR. Do you know what they can do? They can use a form of bioterrorism to bring that into Rwanda. So I ask you this question. I just got off the phone with Mathilde last night. She's the ambassador from Rwanda to the United States. First time ever a female. She asked me to go back. Why? This disease is starting to spread. And they're fearing it's going to come into Rwanda, even though Partners in Health has set up all of these clinics around the country, 
in case it does. They're trying to build a moat around Rwanda. She said, please come back because you're the one who knows those folks in the DRC. You've worked with them on conflict resolution. You have their trust. You can get them to agree to cease fires so that those groups don't pick up arms. And then the World Health Organization, Doctors Without Borders, they can all get back to work. And I said, yes, looking like astronauts who really scare the people in the clothes that they're wearing, putting them in those tents with Velcro so people can look inside the pieces of plastic. But she said, please get back because you believe in this and you can save so many lives and keep it from spreading into Rwanda. So again, conflict resolution leading to a ceasefire, leading to doctors getting back to work, leading to two companies and their vaccinations, which is, have now been approved, Merck and Johnson & Johnson. This could solve this problem very quickly. So I called my mother last night and I said, Mom, I know you just turned 84 on Halloween and you were so sweet to come over and visit me in Rwanda. You know I love that country. I've just been asked to return to help out with the Ebola outbreak. Remember the word listen spelled another way? There was about a minute of silence on the other end of the phone. Mom said, Carl, I know this is your passion. I know this is what you believe in. You make the decision and just let me know. And to finish up, I'm going to read you a poem, which is an example of why I believe in this. And this poem was written in memory of a child I dealt with in Rwanda who unfortunately passed away. Reached out and held an orphan, suffering from HIV. Rocked her, sang to her, she was so sad and skinny. So wanted there to be some hope in her short, short life. Some suture for the wound left by death's dull, rusty knife. She's like thousands of kids dying in Rwanda each day from a disease that is quickly running away. A pandemic killing millions, many think it's funny that so many kids die while drug companies make so much money. When will we all stand up and say AIDS is killing too many innocent kids each day? When will money hungry executives stop lying and help these poor kids who are really dying? These children are so often the victims of greed and ignorance and apathy and a denial of their need. Why are these poor kids placed one after another in coffins with no keys? My sister, my brother. And the refrain of the song, which I'm going to play you right now, we must create a bastion of hope to help those innocent children cope. From a deadly disease, we have the magic for, but so often to choose to simply ignore. And this song is what I wrote for this child. Her name is Lucy, who represents so many other kids who are dying of AIDS in Rwanda and elsewhere. I'm just going to play the piano for them before. And what you'll hear in this song, music as a form of therapy I use in conflict resolution, is major and minor keys. You'll hear the major keys, which are positive things, and the minor keys, which are negative. And then you'll hear how the little girl goes to heaven eventually at the end.
I can't tell you how emotional this makes me when I've seen this. And it is, can't hear me? Okay. I can't tell you how emotional this is in terms of having seen this, and again, smelled it, lived it, breathed it. And in another uh, lecture that I have, I talk about the pros and the cons of President Kagame and what he has done in that country to really improve it over the years, though he con continues to uh, be called a dictator. But anyway, my belief in the power of youth and the preventive diplomacy measure of, of uh, being able to prevent conflict by educating youth more effectively, I use the case study approach to conflict resolution that I begin to work, began to work on at the Tufts Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy when I had two incredible mentors. One is a man by the name of Jeswald Salacuse, who lives in Concord. And the second one, a man by the name of Roger Fisher, who was the co-author of Getting to Yes. And I said, to be able to create these model UN type of case studies on specific conflicts and then force students to play the roles of many different sides, even though they don't agree with them. I think that's going to be a trick of the trade in terms of getting this into classrooms around the United States. The first one I wrote on the Arab-Israeli conflict, titled, Who's Jerusalem? W-H-O-S-E, Jerusalem, question mark. You should see the different political parties that are in that group, including Likud and Fatah. How about taking that into a Newton High School and forcing students to play the roles of others? That's stage one with my case study approach. Stage two, connecting those students around the US with students in the area of conflict that I've worked with. In the Middle East, in Rwanda, I've got a case study on Rwanda. You connect them via Skype. Stage three, go and take them there. And that's what I've been doing in Rwanda for years. We are now on the verge, through the United States government, of creating a program for high school students right here in Massachusetts, based at the Tufts Fletcher School, where we will not only be teaching that conflict resolution approach, each morning, students will be learning one of several critical languages that we need in the world. Arabic, Mandarin, Urdu, Farsi, or Punjabi. In the afternoon, international security studies, which was my major at Fletcher under Richard Schultz, what is cyber terrorism and how do we prevent problems with that? What is artificial intelligence? What is domestic terrorism? What is international terrorism? And taking them to visit Lincoln Lab, taking them to visit Needle at BU, the Nationally Emerging Infectious Diseases Lab, overseen by Bob Brown and others. Anthrax and Ebola are both there in terms of how to come up with a medication for them. The other place we're going, on Route 27 in Maynard, there is an old FEMA site on Old Marlboro Road as you're going toward Sudbury. That FEMA site is now Homeland Security. It goes down five floors. It can withstand a nuclear explosion and being able to work with Homeland Security there on chatter, for example, social media chatter. Once we start to harness students like this in high school, something that we finally got approved last year at the National Security Agency and the Central Intelligence Agency. They both had summer programs for high school students with top TS, top security clearance. We're gonna do the same thing coming up this year. So my belief in getting students early, teaching them these things early, so that when they get to college, they can continue on this track to improve US reputation around the world and prevent the cancer of conflict more effectively. Can you tell I believe in this? Yes. It's all about the kids. Thank you. <laughs> questions? Uh, questions, if anyone has questions, I would be more than happy. I could go on for three hours about this. I'm so passionate. I need to find the other mic. OK, I'll find it back here. Anyone have a question? Oh, we're looking for the other mic. There we go. There, one for me, one for you. One for you, one for me. Any questions? I would like to know. Sure. I would like to know more about that building that's out 
Uh, and Maynard, did you say? Want to come for a visit? <laughs> Okay, so as you're going on Route 27 from Maynard to Sudbury, there is a pretty artificial turf soccer field there and tennis courts. Right in Maynard, right near the border of Sudbury and Maynard, is an old FEMA site where, for example, if there is a tornado issue or a hurricane issue around the United States, they have FEMA sites around the country to be able to deal with issues like this, where all these experts come together very quickly and they're down underground. And after World War II, they were built because we could have had some sort of a nuclear attack. This place is incredible. Now, all the signs have been taken down because it's Homeland Security. And we do what's called fusion there. Not fission, but fusion. So all the information comes around, comes in from around New England, and then it's distributed to state patrol, local police officers, sheriffs, et cetera, in terms of who's coming into town. For example, people like uh, President Trump, if you were to come, uh, political candidates that are coming to town, or keeping an eye on people, for example, uh, in the Muslim community in Sudbury, where someone was actually arrested and it was discovered there. So it's a really incredible site where, and this is what my whole theory of global intelligence quotient means. Think about GIQ in that theory. That means academic smarts globally, but who does it help as well? Our intelligence community. So that is my piece, is youth in the area and what they're learning via social media and they're fluent in Arabic, or they're fluent in Urdu, or Punjabi. It's amazing once you gain their trust, and that's exactly what I did in Rwanda with growing Al-Qaeda, Al-Shabaab, Boko Haram, ISIS, ISIL. They're all over the place there. And to let you know about this, uh, in terms of one, and one more thing to add, that is a major reason why the ambassador from Rwanda to the US called me last night. Think about who is funding those rebel groups in that area of Ebola. ISIS has the biggest account with those rebel groups. So they need someone to get in there who understands it to make sure that this doesn't continue to pick up. And again, I love it. I believe in it. I have built relationships for a long time. I don't know if I'm going to return. Yes. <clears throat> What happens after Katami? After, President oh my goodness, that's a great question that I was going to try and bring up in the talk but didn't have the time. So President Kagami, getting to know him right after 1994, he started to lead in the year 2000. He was not first elected until 2003. He promised us, me included, that he was only going to have two seven-year terms if reelected, 2003 to 2010, 2010 to 2017. In 2016, I'll never forget the conversation. I'm going to my parliament to see if they'll allow me to have a third term. In 2017, he was reelected with 97.5 percent of the vote. Who is the party? What's the name of the ruling party? Ruling party. RPF, exactly the name of the forces that came in to free the country, now has a political wing, okay? So he is now president for another seven years until 2024. His little add-on, his post-it note that he stuck on in parliament, he has the possibility of two five-year terms after that. Well, I think we have time for one Short question because it's past our dinner time. Exactly, you know and I just want, <laughs> and I just wanted to say, my my uh, in terms of knowing his children, Brian, who is the baby, who's out at Williams as a senior, is his pick to run the show. But he can't say that in terms of a true democracy. He's also setting up better education in that country, so you have better future candidates. That was a big part of my role. One short question. Or maybe we should say wrap it up. Thank you. Okay, oh, thank very, you. Very, very nice. Pleasure. Truly a pleasure to be here. Thank you all for coming.